can always confirm that we are we are being recorded or is, yeah recorded yeah I believe so All right All right Okay, Collins, can you uh, see the slide? Yes, Prof. Power in politics. Oh, fantastic. Great. So we can see that, which is one of the topics uh, for this year, uh, for this uh, uh, course, power and politics. Great. All right, colleagues, uh, we are going to start uh, our discussion today uh, with uh, the topic power and politics in organization, power and politics. So first and foremost, we'll start with uh, power, power and politics in organization. Now the bottom line of the matter is, uh, when we talk about power, we are talking about the capacity of a person to influence another person. You see. So that is, for instance, a capacity that a person A has to influence the behavior of a person B. You see. Or the power that Eric has to has to influence Sonorita. That is power, you see, the capacity. For instance, Eric has to influence Sonorita. That is the power of Eric over Sonorita, you see. So the capacity that A has to influence the behavior of B, at B, for instance, so that Sonorita acts in accordance to Eric's wish. That is power, can you see? It's a capacity that A, A, now in this case, I use uh, uh, a colleague in the class, Eric has to influence the behavior of B, Sonorita, so that B, that is Sonorita, acts according to the wishes, or uh, according to the wish of Eric. That is power of Eric over Sonorita, can you see? So the capacity that A has to influence the behavior of B, that B acts in accordance to the wishes of A, that is what power means. Can you see? And power has to do with a very important element, which is of course dependency, what is known as dependency. So when you are so dependent on a particular person, then that person begins to have more power 
and control over you. We take from instance, African nations. Many African nations are dependent on Europeans. Can you see? They are somewhat dependent on Europeans. They are dependent on, on aid in the West or uh, from Europe. That makes African countries weak, can you see? Because if all you look for is aid, aid, foreign aid, definitely you become a beggar begging for aid. So you are dependent on Europeans. And that makes Europe to have more power over you. European countries to have power over you, can you see? So that is dependency, you know? And if you look at even currently also, it seems to me that even African nations are beginning also to lose their power. So China, can you see? Because Africans are depending so much on Chinese loan and China is ready to give it as, as you know, you want. And that is in even African countries to lose power. So China, can you see? Because they are dependent on Chinese. So that makes Chinese more powerful, can you see? So dependency. This relationship to A, when A possess something that B requires. That is why you see that even when the Chinese president can summon African leaders, almost the 52 African leaders will line up. In fact, there was a, a, a video of that, you know, and somebody was saying, the beggars in China, can you see? African leaders were summoned in China by the president of China. And each one of them was were, were called after the other for handshake with the Chinese president. Can you see? Like I can see people commenting on social media, the beggars in China. Can you see? Because African leaders seems to be, many of them, not all, seems to be collecting Chinese loan. Can you see? So China have something very important that they need. Even African leaders, African countries that have mineral resources are still going to China to borrow. Now you see, are still going to China to borrow. That weakens Africa. Then Chinese, the power of Chinese, although Chinese has been a powerful country, the power will accelerate because Africans are dependent. So the dependency theory is what has actually perpetuated African uh, 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 weakness or weaknesses. People who were made to understand that even the AU is not actually sponsoring themselves, that somehow Europeans have an influence in funding the African Union. Can you see? If Europeans are supported in funding the African Union, definitely African Union become dependent of European influence. Can you see? Even the NAPAD initiative, we were told that to a certain extent, it was funded by Europeans. And in fact, Europeans insist that they will be part of the NAPAD. NAPAD, which was supposed to be a kind of an African initiative. So if you have most of these foreign influences in your activities, where is your secrecy as a continent? So the power relation. So I have given an example of countries and continental uh, uh, influences when it comes to power. But, but now the same thing applies to people within an organization. Can you see? If B depends on A, what A has to has uh, in possession, definitely B will be subjected to A's influence. Can you see? That is to say that A now has more power than B. Can you see? Within the organization. Can you see? I will see most of this thing playing out where somebody, even without having a kind of a legitimate power, or authority power may begin to influence somebody in the organization because he has certain special things to offer that the second person depends on. And you see, so that is what power is uh, uh, all about. All right, we progress. Now let's contrast leadership and power. 
leadership and power. Leadership focuses on goals, goal achievement. The focus of leadership is to achieve of the organization. Whereas with regards to power, power uses, power is used as a means for achieving goal. It's used as a means of achieving goal. Whereas the focus of leadership is on goal achievement. The power is a means towards leadership. Leadership will require goal compatibility with followers. Leadership requires that the goal that the organization is articulating is, incom is compatible with the goals of the followers. Can you see? That is why I told you that when the goals of the organization and the goals of the employees are incompatible, there is always a crisis. The employee will leave the organization. Of course, the organization will, of course, have failed in terms of productivity and in terms of quality. And you see, so there must be a kind of congruence between the goal of an organization or a unit or a, a department and the goals of individual employees. However, with regards to power, power requires followers' dependency. Can you see? Dependency. Instead of compatibility, power requires dependency. So power must have what the followers depend on. Can you see? And in terms of contrasting between uh, 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 in terms of contrasting between leadership and power, the third one is leadership focuses on influence, influence, which is of course downward influence. Can you see? Focuses influence downward, and like one would define one would that with uh, the topic of leadership. I told you that leadership is all about influencing. Influence winning people, can you see? And of course, the influence has to be somebody on the top influencing uh, downward. That is leadership. Now, with regards to power, power can use lateral, upward, or downward influence. Can you see? Uses used to gain lateral. When we talk about lateral, that is power is used to gain both horizontal influence within organization. When we say horizontal in, uh, influence, that is between our department at equal level. And of course, upward, that is being able. Power can be used to even influence those on top of you. Can you see? That is why you can see that there are certain employees at the lower hierarchy of the organization, but management respect them. Management can fear them because they've got power within that organization. Whatever that power is coming from, nobody knows. Can you see? But that is what used to be lateral and upward uh, influence. I remember during the uh, military regime in Nigeria, during the military junta in Nigeria, there was one military officer who was just who was a major in the, the military, but the, the generals in the military fear him. Can you see? Of course, because he's, he's the uh, uh, special aide to the president and uh, Sonia Bacha. And, but of course, he is, he is considered to be very <laughs> brutal. And of course, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you fall into his trap, uh, even as a general, <laughs> in fact, uh, you, you, may, you may be in great danger. Yeah, you see? So now that he is uh, uh, have, uh, uh, using authority as a senior person, but there is a kind of where power is coming from. So used to gain literal and of course uh, upward uh, uh, influence, can you see? Then of course, uh, research focus, the research focus with regard to leadership uh, is of course the leadership styles, which you have dealt with or which you have discussed in the class and relationship with uh, followers, the different styles and their relationship with followers. With regards to uh, power, the research focus is power tactics, tactics for gaining influence on others, for gaining 
compliance from others. That is see. So those are uh, uh, two ways, uh, the ways to contrast between leadership and of course uh, power, all right? We progress. And of course, basis of power. What are the basis of power? We have the first one, which is of course, former basis of power. Former basis of power or former uh, uh, power is established by an individual's position in an organization, now you see. Of course, conveys the ability to coerce. If you are in a position of authority, you have the ability to coerce or reward. Now you see, you have the ability to force people to do things or reward people. Of course, from former authority or from control of information. Former authority like the management, the, the director, the manager, senior manager, they have a kind of formal authority to coerce, to force people to do certain things or reward, uh, 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 as, as the case may be. You know, if you're not able to, if you're not doing it, you will not be rewarded. Can you see? From former authority or from control of information. Can you see? And of course, uh, when we talk about coercive power, we are talking about a power base dependent on fear. A power based dependent on fear. For instance, if you, do, or if you fail to do this, or if you, if, you do, if you don't meet your expectation, you will face a disciplinary hearing. That is coercive power, can you see? You, 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 you threaten people that if they don't comply or if they misbehave, definitely they will face disciplinary hearing and possibility of dismissal, can you see? That is a power based on fear. And of course we have another power which is based on reward reward power. That is compliance achieved based on the ability to distribute reward that others views that others view as valuable or important. Can you see? Reward power that is compliance achieved based on the ability to distribute reward that others view as valuable or important to them. Can you see? So those are the two uh, different parts of uh, uh, kind of power, uh, which of course uh, is tied to the initial definition, former power, the ability to coerce, and of course uh, reward. So uh, uh, that, that brings now about the coercive power, and of course uh, the reward uh, power. We're still talking about basis of power. You can see the former power there which of course is a diagram also that reflected what we spoke about uh, issues of uh, standardization and of course uh, issues of authority uh, within a, an organization. You can see authority there is the bigger man there, uh, followed has power over uh, the other two uh, uh, centers of authority and the center uh, authority has power over the uh, bottom line, uh, the, the smaller uh, authority. So these are what we call legitimization of power, or uh, which is known as legitimate power. That is a power a person receives as a result of his or her position in the former hierarchy of an organization. Let me see. And of course, we have also information power. Information power is the power that comes from access and control over information. Can you see? So there are certain individuals in the organization, they get information more than any person. Either because they may be closer to the powers that be within an organization, or they may be working in the uh, IT section where they get a lot of information of or on occurrences uh, that you take place uh, or things that you take place in an organization. So they've got information power, can you see? So power that come from access to and control over information, can you see? 
And um, we will talk also about information. You, you all know today that information is a critical resource in any organization or in any field of, in any walks of life. And you see, information is a critical resource. Which is why organizations have started realizing this. And that is why now we have management information system in organizations. Can you see? Where, of course, information is a gather related to our competitors, related to how human resources are managed in other organization, and all these inform the decisions we take in our own organizations. I see. So information is now a critical uh, asset. In fact, uh, I knew about this uh, when I was uh, also doing my uh, master's, uh, because during my master's, uh, during my stay in India, uh, we we did about we did a management information system. Uh, you see that the fact that uh, organizations are connected by information, and of course organizations uh, is also a subsystem to the bigger system. And the same way, also information become a subsystem within an organization that supply a kind of live blood to the organization. All right. So information power is. Power that comes from access to and power. Now we're going to talk about personal power. Uh, initially, we have uh, spoken about former power. Now we're not going to talk about personal power. Personal power uh, in terms of basis of power. The first one we have expert power. Can you see? Expert power, that is influence based on special skills and knowledge. Can you see? If you have a special key, skill uh, that is scarce, and few people not have that skill, you've got power because everybody will be running to you to, to resolve their issues, to solve their problem for them, or to get an idea from you. On the basis of that, you have influence over others. Can you see? If you look at the diagram there, you can see the man there drawing a picture and everybody's looking at it. Can you see? That is a man with expert power. Everybody wants to learn from him. So that places him in a power position. And you see, now some of us who are professors today also, sometimes we we'll see our younger colleagues troop into our office. Uh, Prof, uh, who do you think about this? Uh, Prof, how do I go about this methodology? You know, then that gives you a power, can you see? Because you have an influence. So that is expert power, influence based on special skills or knowledge. Can you see? And of course, we have, with regards to personal power, we have what we call reference power. Reference power is influence based on possession by an individual of desirable resources. Can you see? Or personal traits. Can you see? That also is almost close to expert power, but of course, you have certain personal traits. And of course, resources that other people desire. And of course, I think I also with regards to resources, I use the example of China and of course uh, 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 the West uh, in terms of the resources African countries desire. You know, but now when we talk now with an organization, it could be a kind of a personal trait of a, a particular person that we admire, possibility that we admire that person and we see him as almost our guru. Can you see? We see him as almost a guru. In fact, there are certain uh, uh, academics that I have mentored. And uh, I remember uh, 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 recently some of them were doing some work and uh, they included my name. And I just advised them, no, don't include my name if I am not part of that uh, 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 work. You know, they were doing that because they, they just admire me. They admire my academic contributions and they want to identify with me. Can you see? So that is what they call reference power. People admire you because of your personality trait or certain desirable resources uh, 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 that you have. You know, so that is reference uh, power. Now we have charismatic power. Uh, of course, you remember we have that with uh, charismatic leadership in the organization. Uh, you see, when people attribute certain iconic power or iconic attribute to a particular individual, you know, so which is an extension of reference power stemming from an individual personality 
an interpersonal star. Can you see? Personality. And we have spoken about the personality of charisma, uh, charismatic people, which is, of course, charismatic people are charming. Can you see? And they know the way they can, of course, you know, attract people to them. Can you see? Uh, in such a way that people begin to uh, 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 live according to their influence. Can you see? And I remember we have enumerated uh, uh, some of the charismatic leaders during our leadership uh, course. These people have influenced people either from their voice, their vocal, the way they vocalize uh, uh, issues. For instance, when you hear Martin Luther uh, King speak, uh, in fact, even if you are sleeping, you will know that no, this voice is that of Martin Luther King. Can you see? So those are. Uh, a charismatic power, which is an extension of reference power stemming from an individual's personality and, of course, interpersonal style. You can see, for instance, uh, in this uh, boardroom, you can see, of course, uh, uh, there's somebody with power there. Uh, that is the man sitting at the uh, edge, uh, 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 at the uh, uh, center of, of the table there. Uh, you can see that uh, he has power. He said, I was just, just, just a cartoon. He said, I was just going to say, well, I don't make the rules. But of course, I do make the rules. Can you see? It's just a kind of cartoon, you know. So that is, of course, uh, uh, a sign of power uh, within uh, an organization. All right. Now, dependency. The dependency is the key to power, I see. It's the key to power, whether we like it or not. Dependency is the key to power, I see. All right. Uh, just give me a minute. Somebody is trying to call me. Let me, and it's one of your colleagues. Let me see who is. Yes, I'm in the class. Who is speaking? Hello? Hello? I'm in a class. Hello? Yeah, yeah, what can I do for you? Yeah, what can I do for you? I'm hearing you. All right. So I think it's one of your colleagues, I don't know. Uh, it's a call from Namibia. Uh, and I don't know if she's struggling to, if she's struggling to be part of uh, part of the class, uh, but let me see. Okay, somebody, uh, let me see her email. Good morning, Prof, this is Sophia. I'm at the village. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay. I think it should be uh, Sophia. She says she's in the village and there was heavy rain there and she's struggling with connectivity uh, issue. Okay, uh, I understand. Let me reply her. No total times. All right, okay. Right. All right. So uh, I will progress. Uh, I know the call was coming from Namibia, which is why I decided to answer uh, because uh, uh, we have to know what is happening to one of us. All right. So dependency is a key to power. Let me see. It's a key to power. The general dependency postulate. The greater, the greater B's dependency on A, the greater the power A has over B. You see? The greater dependency on A, the greater the power A has over B. So the more you depend on a person, the greater the person has power over you. you see? And of course, possessions to control of scarce resources. And so when somebody possesses or control scarce resources that others need makes a manager powerful 
Now, if you put it on the country basis, Africa has scarce resources that a European need. Now you see, Africans, Africa as a continent has, has scarce resources that Chinese need. Because our leadership have reduced Africa to beggars. These people also come to Africa and they take control of African resources. Now you see, they take ownership of African resources. Which resources is not in Africa? You talk about the gold, you talk about the diamond, you talk about the petrol or the crude oil, you talk about uh, 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 the uranium, a full, a lot of them in Congo. But what is Africa showing for that? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Instead, they run into Europe, they run into China to borrow money. I see. So possession, control of scarce organizational resources. Uh, when, we, when we go now to continental or country related, now leaving the organization, the wider horizon, you can see that we have to a great extent reduce our power. Without Africa, the world cannot survive. I'm telling you the truth. Without Africa. And so you see that there is now a kind of competition to win Africa. There is another, a kind of, uh, 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 what do they normally call it, uh, uh, scavenging for Africa. When are the competition is between China and the West. And they will give us all tied to Africa on the rise. We are not rising anything. The point of the matter is that we still depend and we are not actually exploiting our resources. The West come to Africa, they put a price tag on our resources. And when we go to buy most of the resources that they have produced as a finished product, they also put price tag. So they price our resources and put the price tag and when we go to price, they also put their price tag. So we don't have control over our mineral resources, over our, uh, over our resources that is supposed to be very scarce, can you see? So that makes us perpetually dependent on the West, or on Europe. So Africa need to wake up, can you see? Africa really need to wake up on this. All right, okay, your colleague is responding. Africa really need to wake up and possess their power because Africa has this resources that Europe needs. Africa has the scarce resources that China needs. But Africa is weak when we fail to realize our potentials, when we fail to realize that we've got what most of these people need. Africa will continue to be dependent when we continue to show inferiority complex compared to the West and of course to not Chinese. In the 80s, in the 90s, uh, in the 80s, in the 70s. The Indians leave India to, to teach in Africa, in African countries. You go to Ghana, you go to Nigeria, you go to West Africa. Indians leave India to teach in Africa. Of these Asian tigers, India, Indonesia, uh, South Korea, Africa was ahead. But today, almost all African countries are perpetually dependent on Asia and, of course, on Europe. Influence, can you see? And so we are losing our power and influence. Can you see? I'm talking about country. A situation, continental situation when it comes to issues of power and dependency. You see? And I think there was even a paper I wrote on that. Uh, 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 what has, of course, kept Africa behind? 
the perpetual dependency on the West and now on Asia. And you see, with China rising. Most of these countries, India, China, uh, Singapore, South Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, all these countries were at the same level with Africa in the 1960s. When most of these countries started getting their independence, India got their independence in 1948, or 1947-48 in between. Of course, most of the Indonesians and others called Singapore, they all got their independence at the same period. Even if look, if you remember Dubai in those period, Dubai was like a village, one of the villages in, uh, in uh, Namibia. That was how Dubai looks like. But today, the 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 the, the, the Arabs are wiser. Can you see? Today, now everybody go to Dubai as uh, tourists. Everybody go to Dubai to shop. Everybody want to visit Dubai. Dubai has become a center of attraction. Can you see? So we really need to wake up. We really need to wake up that we don't lose our power so that we don't depend so much on the West or on China. Can you see? So we need to take control. Can you see? So we, we, we've got the resources. We've got scarce resources. But we have not realized that we've got it. We have not realized what we have. Can you see? We have not realized what we have. And we are not training our people on how to be the ones turning our raw materials into finished products. Can you see? So we are just a continent supplying raw materials. And those purchasing raw materials come to Africa, they put the price tag, they bargain, and they take it to Europe. They process it into a finished product. They still bring it to Africa, they put the price tag. So we don't have bargaining power, can you see? We don't have bargaining power. One, 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 remember when I talked about negotiation or bargaining, we don't have any uh, 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 object of negotiation. You see, we don't have basis for negotiation. And of course, that also reengage also within an organization. When an individual possesses scarce organizational resources that others need, you see, that others need, when somebody possesses scarce organizational that others need, that makes, for instance, a manager more powerful. I see. If a manager possesses or control scarce organizational resources that other members of the organization need, that manager is more become more powerful. Access to optional resources, multiple suppliers. If there are multiple suppliers, or if there are multiple uh, assets, optional resources, that of course can reduce the power of a power holder. Can you see? That can reduce the power of a power holder. Because if you if you approach him and he's being a difficult, you can approach the alternative person. Can you see? You can approach another person. Can you see? So access to optional resources, or for instance, if there are multiple suppliers to that resources, that reduces the power of the power holder. Can you see? All right. What creates dependency? What creates dependency? Yeah. Yes. I was just thinking that last point, the optional resources or multiple suppliers, isn't that actually what reduces Africa's power when it comes to resources? Because if uh, Namibia said, look, man, I'm going to price my diamonds 10 times the amount, Mm -hmm. Then the West or China just go to the DRC and they get it cheaper there. And so that reduces yeah. our this power. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that is a very good example also. That is all, yeah, that's a very good example. And uh, how do we yeah. overcome such? We can overcome such if we can, of course, uh, constitute a kind of uh, united uh, 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 beginning. Africa need to unite. 
in order to bargain yes. effectively. Yeah, that, that yes. is just like OPEC, which regards to petroleum. OPEC is mm. uh, an organization that regulates uh, petroleum uh, producing countries, you know. So yeah. if they can unite to bargain, you know, that is why they say unity in strength. There is, there is strength in unity, you know. So if they can unite, I would say, okay, this is our price tag, you know. Definitely, yeah. they will actually benefit more uh, instead yeah. of uh, each one of them bargaining or underbidding themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah thank, thank you very you. much for that insight. You, you, you really gave a, a very, uh, a very good example uh, to what I was trying to explain. All right. So uh, that is that with regards to optional resources. So what created the there are three things that create dependency. The first one is importance of the resources to the organization. Importance of the resources create dependency. Now, with regards to national issue, importance to the resources, if we talk about now the issue of loan, you know, money is very important to any country. And as a result of mismanagement, many African countries have, of course, mismanaged resources. Now they need these resources. So that is why many of them are dependent on China. Chinese loan has become a famous term. Now you see, Chinese loan. Previously, it was European aid, foreign direct investment, or of course, uh, aid to Africa. Now you see. But one thing you must know nothing comes freely when you depend on aid. You see, they give you with one hand, they take with two hands. Yeah, you see, when you are dependent on somebody for AIDS, you lose your respect, you lose, you lose your power. That is why, of course, uh, I was actually very happy with uh, what uh, the Ghanaian president told uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron of France. When Emmanuel Macron gave a speech, I was saying uh, France will now support Ghana with additional aid. I think when the Ghanaian president rose up, he told the man and Macron, we don't need your aid any longer. And you see, we don't need your aid any longer because we have realized that this aid is not actually helping us. Because when somebody gives you free money, suddenly you will be jumping, you will be dancing. When the person says jump, you will jump. Can you see? Nobody giving you, just look at small children. Just go to small children, you give them petty cash. They will jump on you. You know, daddy, they will jump on you. You know, when you tell them wrong, they will run. Then you give them petty cash. You see? So that was what the West was giving to Africa. They said they are giving you AIDS. What kind of AIDS? You see? They give you the tech. They give you with one hand, they take resources with two hand. You see? So, Importance of the resources is also an issue. I know I'm just expanding your horizon so that you know, uh, I'll give an example of a national issue and of course, how it applies to organization also. Important of resources. Another aspect that creates dependency is scarcity. Scarcity of resources. And I give you an instance. Africa has scarce resources in abundance. But now the reverse is the case. Africa still depends on the West. You see. Definitely, this tendency may also be from the West, making Africa perpetually dependent on them. You see. Making every effort to make sure that Africa is not able to rise. Because we have great population that is also patronizing their goods. So if African countries can rise, who will buy European goods? And you see, who will buy most of this? So we are, we are more or less a dumping ground. All production for China, all production for the West is dumped in Africa, which is part of an economic theory, dumping. And you see, so the reverse is the case with regards to Africa. We've got to discuss resources, but we still depend on China and of course on Europe to of course engage with our resources. You see. So because we have not developed the technical know-how,
refining our oil. For instance, with the case of Nigeria, Nigeria sent their crude oil to overseas to refine. And these people refine it and import it back to Nigeria to buy. Is that not stupidity or foolishness? You see? That is the issue. You see? So scarcity of resources. So we we'll still continue to be dependent. That creates dependency theory. You see? Dependency theory, which of course makes African countries perpetually dependent on the West. And in recent time, we seem to now be moving towards the East. Sometimes you hear Africans saying that, of course, I think it's, it is more better to do business in China. But whether you like it or not, a time will come when China will also act like the West by keeping us perpetually dependent. Because definitely China is competing the, with the West. That is why they will give us a better turn for now. But the time will come when they will show us that, no, we are more me than the West, <laughs> you see? So those are things we have to actually uh, keep at the back, uh, back, uh, back of our mind in terms of some of the activities that we are uh, engaging in uh, with uh, both Asia and the West, all right? Now, of course, uh, 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 dependency is created when resources is not substitutable, uh, substitutable. Can you see? Non-substitutability of resources. When resources is non-substitutable, definitely dependency is created. Can you see? So which is the target? Right. When you cannot sub substitute the resources, then that may create a kind of dependency because you cannot go to another person because the, 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 the resources has no sub substitute, can you see? Then definitely you will stick to the person you patronize. You continue to depend on that person, see, which is of course a dependency theory. All right. Then of course, uh, we'll talk about power tactics. Power tactics, can you see? There are different forms of power tactics different forms of power tactics. Uh, uh, power tactics is ways in which individuals, in which individuals translate power basis into specific action. That is ways in which individuals translate power basis into action. And of course, we'll have different power tactics. The first one there is legitimacy. Legitimacy, we have spoken about uh, legitimate power. I see. I've spoken about legitimate power. Legitimate power. Who hierarchies in an organization. All right. And of course, we'll have, of course, a rational persuasion. Rational persuasion. And being able to persuade people, you know, to, to, to follow your tune. Of course, rational persuasion can, in fact, be, be used to influence even somebody in a senior position where you present logical reasoning why this should be so. Can you see? So, that's just another tactics in terms of uh, 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 tactics of uh, power, where you present rational argument to persuade the other person to follow your line of action. Can you see? And another aspect of uh, 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 influence tactics, or uh, tactics uh, how to influence people is of uh, inspirational appeal. What that is a looping emotional commitment by appealing to a target, a target group. Can you see? Inspirational appeal, you know, creating a kind of appealing uh, 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 atmosphere. Uh, people are a kind of uh, attracted to actually your ideas, your vision, what you articulate or what you want to achieve. And then another aspect, of course, uh, with regards to influencing tactics is, of course, which is uh, consultation. When we talk about consultation, that is increasing the target support, uh, you see, by involving him or her in deciding 
how you will accomplish your plan. So that is consultation. That is why you see also in organization, we say when you consult with people that a decision will affect, definitely they feel very comfortable with that. That is how we say, the, the, are you, did you consult? Did you consult employees before this decision was reached? Consultation is part of industrial democracy or part of workers' participation in management, whereby some people before a decision is made. And of course, people buy into that decision because they feel that they have been consulted. Can you see? They have been consulted. So true that means you influence them. That is another uh, way of uh, 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 power tactics or influence uh, tactics. Another aspect to, to get to influence tactics is, of course, exchange. Can you see? Exchange is a, a kind of situation whereby you reward, rewarding the target with benefit or favor in exchange for following your request. For instance, if you tell your target, well, if you're able to achieve this, every one of you will be promoted. You have given them a sign in terms of exchange. Or you will be rewarded in kind, a monetary term. Can you see? That is another way of uh, uh, influencing uh, tactics. And another aspect of influencing tactics is, of course, pers personal appeal. Personal appeal, your, your personality. That is asking for compliance based on friendship and loyalty. Can you see? Asking for compliance based on friendship, you know, reminding the person, oh, I think we have been friends for years and you know what i can do you know so please i need your compliance i need your support on this so personal appeal appealing to the next person that yes uh, uh please you know we have a long way can you see so that's personal appeal another one is ingratiation ingratiation is of course influencing people by flattering flattering them okay making them feel happy you know, maybe before you demand a request from him, you say, ah, guy, you look handsome. No, I know you're a great guy. You know, yes, sir, definitely you are always on point. You know, the person will be happy first before you tell him what you want, <laughs> okay, you see? So that is also part of influence tactics. Uh, you see, when you tell say, oh, guy, uh, handsome, or if it's a lady, ah, you say, ah, Regina, you look beautiful today. Wow, oh, your hair is looking absolutely nice, you know? Now, before you tell him, oh, Regina, please, uh, I want us to do this work uh, together, you know. Then after prison, <laughs> Regina, she, she may be ashamed to deny you or to, to refuse your request. And you see, you see her by the end. That is what is known as ingratiation. Another aspect in terms of influencing tactics is, of course, a pressure. And you see, pressure has to do with using warning. Uh, repeated demand and threats, you know, to influence people to do something. And I've given you uh, pressure can be part of that coercive uh, power or coercive influence. And of course, another aspect is coalition. Coalition is when you win more people to join you so that every other people will surrender to your wish. Uh, you see, so you have more supporters than, of course, those who are opposing you. That is enlisted aid or support of others to persuade it, the other person to agree. And that is why you see that every time America is about to, America is about to go to war, they look for coalition. They say it's coalition forces. When they toppled, when they, they, they invaded uh, Libya, they say coalition forces are coming to defend the Libyan people. When they invaded Iraq, there's a coalition forces, can you see? When they, of course, uh, invaded uh, other countries, they talk about coalition, can you see? which is what also they refer to as allied forces, can you see? They bring more people to join them so that, of course, that will justify or that will legalize their action, can you see? So coalition also applies also within organization. Uh, you want to influence others. Now, building more support, getting more people to follow you, you know, so that the other person who now becomes a weaker uh, member of the uh, a weaker member in the organization. 
automatically follows your uh, details. Can you see? So these are different ways of uh, influencing or influence tactics, uh, uh, both within an organization or within the global politics, as the case may be. Is that clear? Is that clear, colleagues? Yes, Prof. Okay. Is that clear? Is in the class? Yes, yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Fantastic. Fantastic. I've not heard from the ladies. I just I'm hearing from the men. Without the ladies saying yes. I think the ladies are cooking, Prof. Wow. <laughs> it's a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> <Is that? laughs> they are multitasking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Ladies, are you cooking? <laughs> no, we are listening, bro. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Okay. At least I've heard from the lady there. Fantastic. So we'll progress. <laughs> right. Now we talk about uh, preferred power tactics. Which one is uh, preferred? In terms of tactics, we have listed the different tactics. When it is a case of upward influence, when of course somebody at a lower level want to influence those at the upper level, I think the best power tactics to use is rational persuasion. That is like I told you, using logical reason in a, presenting a lot of evidences to persuade somebody at the top to agree with you or to work with you or to accept what you are proposing. That is when it is upward in place. When you, you are the lower level of organization or management want to influence somebody at the top, it is much more better to use a, a rational persuasion. Can you see? Now, when it is a case of downward influence, when you at the top want to influence people before you, uh, below you, the best approach to use can be rational persuasion. Of course, you can also use inspirational appeals. Then definitely because you have authoritative power, or executive power, you can use pressure, which is of course coercive. And of course, another uh, uh, another influence that you can use is of course consultation, consulting them before decision is making, which forms part of the whole idea of industrial democracy. Another aspect is ingratiation. And you see, when you are sometimes you can of course spin your your younger colleagues, toast them it's like a man toast a woman. And you see, Telling them something good before you tell them, please, Jonathan, can you do this for me? Can you see? Not that you don't have power to say, Jonathan, do this, but by telling him he does it with his whole heart, you know, uh, you flatter him. Can you see? You flatter him. Uh, Jonathan, I know you are the best in this uh, IT related matter. Uh, please, uh, my laptop is having some challenges. Can you look into it? I know you, 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 are, you are more. Uh, versatile with this than other colleagues. Can you see? So Jonathan will just do it with all happiness. My boss is praising me. Can you see? Or my boss believes in me. Can you see? That is ingratitude. So another, uh, when you are, want to influence people below you, you can of course use exchange also. Either monetary exchange or of course uh, non-monetary exchange. Promise and uh, of course uh, some reward, kind of reward. Uh, in terms of downward influence, also you can use legitimacy, the legitimate power as uh, uh, the manager in the organization, the authority uh, inherent in your position to, of course, in place uh, uh, people under you. Now, when we talk in terms of uh, lateral influence, which is, of course, horizontal influence, of course, you can, of course, still use uh, rational persuasion, consultation, Ingratiation, exchange, which I've, I've explained, legitimacy, of course, also personal appeal, and of course, you can also add a coalition. All right. So these are the preferred power tactics by influence direction, depending on which uh, kind of uh, 
uh, uh, people you want to influence. If you want to go influence people above you, I think rational persuasion will be the best approach. And of course, with regards to downward influence or literal influence, all the lists are there for you to also explore uh, if you want to influence people uh, that are below you or people within the same level with you, which is of course literal influence, all right? Is that clear? Is clear? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes. Yeah, progress. Bro. Okay. Now, factors influencing the choice and effectiveness of power tactics. The first factor there is sequencing tactics. Sequencing tactics. Factors influencing the choice and effectiveness of power tactics. The first one is sequencing tactics. That is softer to harder tactics work best. So you cannot uh, want to influence people and you start using pressure before you start persuading them. Certainly their mind is already biased. But if you start other persuasion, you start, of course, the uh, uh, approaches in, in gratuation, you know, definitely you soften their heart before that you use, uh, if, they, if they are not, if that still remain hardened, that is why you can now use more tougher approach, you see. So softer to harder tactics work best when it, when it comes to sequence in terms of use of practice. Now another aspect, the factors in place in the choice and effectiveness of power tactics, skillful use of tactics. Experienced users are more successful, can you see? Now the more you use different tactics, the more you gain experience which one work best, which is why experienced users are more useful, uh, are more successful when it comes to the use of tactics. Now, of course, relative power of the tactics user, relative power. Some tactics work better when applied downwards, right? When you are in a power position, when you are, of course, uh, in an authoritative position, definitely relative power or uh, relative power of the tactics user is very, very important. So some tactics work better when applied downwards. And of course, another aspect is the type of request attached to the tactics. What is the type of request? You see, is the request legitimate? If the request is legitimate, definitely uh, uh, you will be able to influence the other person to do your bidding. But if the request is illegal and illegitimate, definitely the other person can challenge it and you cannot influence him about it. If you force him, he can in fact blow you off by becoming a whistleblower, can you see? So type of request is also important. So you cannot request the subordinate to do something illegitimate or because you think you possess power and influence. So type of request attaching to the ta uh, ta is very, very critical. How the request is perceived, can you see? How the request is perceived, if the person you are requesting to do your bidding, perceive the request to be ethical, then the person can do your job. But if the person perceives the request to be an unethical way, he can, of course, challenge such request. And you see, so that is uh, 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 how the request is perceived by the person that is, of course, uh, doing your bidding or the person you are trying to influence. The next one is culture of the organization. And you see, culture of the organization. Culture affects users. User's choice of tactic. Culture affects user's choice of tactics. For instance, if the culture of the organization is basal, you can, of course, uh, uh, influence your management. You don't have a say. This is an organization, if, for instance, when we spoke, when I was giving you a story about conflict, that in fact, uh, uh, some organization conflict or uh, some of the uh, thought of conflict, Conflict is not allowed at all. You don't have an, a different view. You, see, you must just respect the organizational culture. You see, under such circumstances, somebody below the hierarchy cannot question or even persuade the, the management to, to change tactics or to do your bidding. So the culture of an organization 
affect users' choice of captives. Another aspect is country specific cultural factors. Can you see? Country specific cultural factors. Local values favor certain tactics over others. Can you see? Look, the, the country, it, it can also have country or regional specific cultural factors, which kind of course influence the kind of tactics that you will adopt uh, to influence other people below you or people above you within an organization. All right, progress. Now, power in group. Power in group, which is, of course, coalition. I told you about coalition. Uh, and I use, of course, uh, American coalition forces or American coalition. When America want to do anything, they start looking for coalition to make what they want to do to look more legal or to look, to look more acceptable. Can you see? You cannot see the war taking place in, the, in, in Ukraine. It's like Russia against America and other parts of Europe. Can you see? And the same thing applies to, of course, uh, the war in Iraq. America alone is more powerful than Iraq to invade Iraq. But America also brought about coalition, brought other Western allies to bomb Iraq. And finally, they captured Saddam Hussein and murdered him in a cold blood by hanging him. Can you see? All justifying coalition. Can you see? The same thing now applies to the issue of uh, Russia. America also. Uh, uh, seems to be in coalition with other Western allies to challenge, of course, uh, the hegemonic power of Russia in that uh, part of Europe. But of course, uh, uh, Russia is also uh, adamantly stubborn. Uh, like I, I told you, if Russia was supposed to be a weak nation, uh, definitely by now Russia would have been, uh, uh, would, have, would have seen the end of her. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Putin uh, uh, by now would have been captured and the uh, possibility of a murder, just like they did to Muammar Gaddafi in Libya and of course Saddam Hussein in Iraq. As someone, uh, you know, with regards to toppling of government. Uh, because of course, uh, Russia has what they have, what they have or uh, has what they have. That is of course, uh, uh, the nuclear weapon, you know, uh, which can, of course, uh, uh, destroy humanity if it's not taken. So that is why they are playing a kind of uh, uh, cautious game, uh, both of the two sides, because uh, the nuclear weapon for countries that have it is an agreement. If you trigger, if you trigger yours, I will trigger mine, and in fact, we'll end the war, uh, which is, of course, what uh, the Jehovah Witness is called the almighty Amagedon, uh, you see. So ladies and gentlemen, let me not travel so far. Let's come back to the topic of the day, which is of course a coalition. Coalition is of course a cluster of individuals, a cluster of individuals. And of course, I'm giving you with regards to national, international coalition. Uh, when I spoke about the issue of American coalition and of course uh, uh, the current issue uh, uh, in Russia, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. So clusters of individuals who temporarily come together to achieve a specific purpose, temporarily come together, and you see. And you can see that uh, if we also use an example of the coalition forces, they temporarily come together to invade the country. And once that invasion is over, everybody goes back to their country. So they don't continue uh, clustering together. That is a good example of coalition. Clusters of individuals who temporarily come together to achieve a specific purpose. A specific purpose. The purpose, the purpose is, of course, uh, to, to, to topple those who are kind of uh, dissident uh, within an uh, organization or those who are opposing uh, 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 a particular uh, uh, issue, a particular objective within an organization. All right. And of course, uh, the, 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 the aspect of coalition, coalition seek to maximize their size. Can you see? Seek to maximize their, their size to attain influence. Can you see? Any question? Okay. Coalition seek to increase their size 
in order to attain influence, can you see? United in strength, can you see? And of course, coalition seek a broad and diverse constituency to support, uh, for support of the charity. They seek a broad and diverse constituency, you know, gather people from different constituencies to support their objectives, can you see? And of course, uh, 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 with regards to uh, coalition, coalition occur more frequently in organizations with high tax, organizations with high tax and resources interdependence. Coalition uh, occur more frequently in organizations with high tax and of course interdependency. Now, of course, that is what brings about coalition because you want to depend on other branches uh, within that organization uh, in order to actually move your motion or in order to actually push uh, for your proposal or, or, or get what you really want, uh, the purpose of that particular coalition. Then of course, coalition occur more frequently if tax are standardized or retained. Can you see, coalition occur frequently if tax are standardized. Uh, uh, within an organization. So these are just a uh, 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 reason why people uh, move uh, into a coalition within an organization. All right. Now we'll come to another aspect of power, which is of course on equal power in the workplace or on equal power in organization, which is of course sexual harassment. Sexual harassment has become a topical issue in organizations in recent time. And of course, when they say sexual harassment, people think it is all about a male colleague in authoritative position harassing a female colleague. It is not always a case of a male colleague. Sexual harassment can come from even a female colleague. You see, powerful women in authority trying to, of course, also uh, influence, or of course, uh, more younger colleagues handsome young guys to actually uh, patronize them sexually, and of course, promise the reward uh, as a result of that, either in form of promotion or in terms of monetary reward. So when we talk about sexual harassment, male uh, manager or a male uh, senior employee and a younger female, not only that, it, it goes above that. It can also be harassment from a female senior officer to a younger colleague within an organization. So sexual harassment is simply an unwelcome advances. Can you see? The person that is being harassed is not actually interested in it. It is an unwelcome advances. Request for sexual favors and other verbal or physical conduct request or sexual favor, but of course, certain uh, 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 physical conduct within an organization which may not actually portray uh, sexual harassment, which is, of course, uh, sometimes referred to as failure to what it is can amount to sexual harassment, can you see? So there are two types of sexual harassment. Uh, the first one is what we call pro, pro quo pro quo harassment, uh, which is of course when you verbally request sexual uh, favor from uh, uh, somebody of an opposite sex. And of course, with the current situation where now we have transgenders and yes, when you forcefully request sexual favor from also a male fellow who is a gay, you see, and then that amounts to sexual harassment uh, with the work environment, uh, which is known as a quid pro quo, quid pro quo pro uh, sexual harassment. But another aspect of sexual harassment is hostile workplace behavior, hostility in work in workplace behavior can also amount to sexual harassment. For instance, for instance, if you are sharing an office with a female uh, uh, or as a male, they are definitely displaying a lot of uh, issues uh, related to pornography 
uh, your system and leaving it very uh, uh, open can of course make the female colleague feel uncomfortable. It's hostile workplace behavior. That can amount to sexual harassment. And not only from the female side, it also can of course happen from the, uh, uh, not only from the male side, it can also happen from the female side. The female who is also displaying a lot of nude, uh, nude uh, pictures of men, and of course of female can also amount to sexual harassment of the opposite side sharing an office with you. So we must be very, very careful in terms of what to do in uh, an organization. You may innocently sharing the uh, looking at the picture, not knowing that it is actually uh, embarrassing to your colleague. Can you see? You can actually, actually face uh, a kind of a disciplinary hearing as a result of that. If your colleague argue that this is a hostile workplace behavior, can you see? So, and of course, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which does the United States, test uh, for determining if sexual harassment has occurred. Can you see? The U.S. Supreme Court gave a test. Whether comment or behavior in a work environment would reasonably be perceived and is perceived as hostile or abusive. I spoke about hostile workplace behavior or abusive. All those include sexual harassment, can you see? It's not just a matter of sexual favor alone, but other comment or behavior in a work environment would reasonably be perceived or is perceived as hostile or abusive to the other person. And see, that amounts to sexual harassment. And for the fact that men and women now work in the workplace, there are also every reason for sexual harassment to occur sometimes, either deliberately or as a case of a, 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 a misunderstanding in terms of a, a certain behavior that somebody has a bit. And of course, there are valid reasons uh, uh, that justify sexual harassment. That is to say that somebody who is offended is not the person who, of course, solicited for that harassment to occur. Uh, because there are instances where, of course, uh, 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 for instance, a female colleague may be giving some positive signal that uh, the male colleague may misunderstand and he start uh, uh, showing some advances, which of course the female colleague can say, no, you're harassing me, can you see? But now the male colleague has to prove that no, actually this female colleague was one who was actually showing some signs which I responded to. And you see, so the female colleague must, or the male colleague, if it is the other way around, must not be the person who is, of course, uh, showing some signal of invitation uh, for that harassment to occur. So one have to also be very vigilant. Uh, when you are bringing up a case of sexual harassment, that in the first place, you are not the one who actually created an environment for sexual harassment to start occurring. Can you see? So we'll have to also put that uh, in perspective. All right. Now, politics. Politics in an organization. We have spoken about power. Now, politics is power in action. Power in action. That is, of course, what politics is all about. So, politics is activities that are not required are part of one formal role in the organization. Activities that are not required as part of one formal role in organization, but that influence or attempt to attempt to influence the distribution of advantages or disadvantages within the organization. So probably you don't actually need power to actually uh, exercise uh, politics. Activity that are not required as one's formal role in organization, you see. So legitimate political behavior, that is normal everyday politics is part of uh, legitimate political behavior. And they say every human being is a political being, you see. So we move and of course, we play along with the politics of the day. But of course, which organization will also have what is called illegitimate political behavior. That is extreme political behavior that violates the implied rules of the game. Can you see? It goes across the rules of the game. 
that is trying to influence something uh, illegitimately. I see. So you have to do extra, there are certain extra things or activities that you have to do. So that is, of course, a illegitimate political behavior. Extreme political behavior that violates the implied rules of the game. Now, some of those are, of course, uh, uh, politics, uh, political behavior, uh, which are, of course, illegal that you see people uh, uh, as, uh, doing in organization or as a bit in an organization uh, as follows. You can see on the right, on the left hand side, there is political labels, some of the behaviors. And of course, on the right side, on the right hand side is effective management labels. If you look at some of the political labels there, you can see that some of them are, of course, uh, 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 somehow controversial or somehow negative or somehow uh, a way of uh, scheming or uh, a little bit uh, derogatory. For instance, uh, uh, a political behavior can be blaming others, blaming others when things go wrong. And you see, that could be a political, uh, even when you are part of those uh, team and you shift blames, and you see, that is a political behavior in an organization. And of course, uh, uh, with regards to effective leadership, leadership feels responsibility. Leadership takes responsibility for anything that goes wrong in an, in, in an organization. That is effective leader. But when it is a political person, he will shift blame. No, this is not my problem. Oh, they are the ones that defaulted. them. I have already planned for something good to happen, but they spoiled everything, even when you are part of the team. So that is, of course, a negative. Uh, political behavior, all right? Then another aspect is kissing up, kissing up. There are certain times uh, people in the organization want to, of course, befriend or placate those in the top of the organization in order to get more influence and power, you see. There are certain people you see in your department, they seem to be very powerful, either because they are mingling with the top management not really in uh, any sexual related relationship, but they have a way of, of course, convincing the uh, top management that they are the best. Can you see? They have a way of, you know, uh, 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 using ingratiation to, of course, placate the top management to see them as, of course, so that is what kissing up is all about. It's also a political behavior which enables one to have influence over others, because if you know somebody is very close to the CEO, then when that person talks, you try to be cautious, you know, so that you don't lose your job, can you see? But that is issues related to kissing up. And of course, in terms of effective management, effective management, instead of kissing up, develop a working relationship with others. Another aspect which is also related to invitation is apple polishing, can you see? A kind of making things to look good, making things to look nice. Everything that you do is good and polished nicely. Can you see? That is, of course, uh, apple polishing in terms of political labor or behavior. And when it gets to effective leadership, effective leaders develop, demonstrate loyalty, both to their followers and, of course, their, 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 their boss. Can you see? Demonstrating uh, loyalty. Another aspect of political behavior that is passing the ball. That is shifting blame also, you see. What went wrong, you pass, you push it to others. That's, that does it not do well. You see, that is part of it. And of course, another political labor include creating conflict. Some people create conflict to, to make people see them as powerful, you see. Forming coalition, that is also a political behavior. And I have given you, for instance, the American way of life. That is global politics for you. When America say we are building coalition to destroy an enemy or to, 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 to free the people of Iraq from Saddam Hussein or to free the people of Libya from, uh, from Muammar Gaddafi, they are forming a, a coalition uh, uh, to be more political uh, uh, in terms of their approach. The whistleblowing is also a political behavior. When you report, people or when you report an organization 
with regards to unethical practices within that organization. That is whistleblowing. Skimming, uh, some people skim. Skimming is also part of coalition, but skimming is also very negative when every time you are building a certain individuals and of course carrying gossip all about. Skimming can also be carrying, just reporting something negative about somebody, even if such is not uh, the truth or the case. It's also a political behavior. And we see people doing that in our in organizations. People skimming how they can, of course, uh, plan against someone within an organization, or how they can take a decision that will affect other people without those who go uh, 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 buying into those decisions. You see? And of course, overachieving, pro projecting yourself as somebody who is doing more than every other person. Uh, that is also a political behavior. Ambitious. Ambitious, ambition is also a political behavior within an organization. Opportunistic, taking advantage of others. That is also political behavior. And you see, taking advantage of people who trusted you. That is also a part of political behavior. Cunning, being a corny person. And you see, cunning, being a very corny person. And you see, corny pe person, very showing some level of intelligence, you know. In our African tradition, they always say the tortoise. If you know the tortoise, they say the tortoise is very corny. And you see, I don't know how the Africans actually originated that, but most of the African folk tales always try to reflect the tortoise as very corny. And you see, but when I look at the tortoise naturally, I see the tortoise as very slow. I remember when I visited Mauritius. I saw a tortoise that is almost as big as, uh, 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 almost as big as uh, 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 most of the small cars that you see, a car. And you see, I was really fascinated uh, when I visited uh, one of the uh, geolo uh, zoological gardens uh, in Mauritius, and you see. So tortoise, uh, they say tortoise is cunning. Uh, cunning is somebody who always uh, have a kind of uh, cruel, cruel. Crooked, crooked behavior, can you see? So that is also part of a political behavior. And of course, arrogance. Arrogance is also kind of a political behavior. Arrogance uh, showing superiority, that you are superior than the others. And of course, perfectioning is also political behavior, showing that you are perfect. You, see? you are the best. You see? That is also political behavior, you know. I was trying to make others to feel that, yes, they can learn from you. you see. And of course, with effective leadership, we have effective leaders delegate authority, effective leaders document decision, effective leaders encourage change and innovation, effective leaders facilitate teamwork, effective leaders improve efficiency, effective leaders plan ahead of time, Effective leaders are competent and capable. Effective leaders are career-minded. Effective leaders are astute, dedicated. And of course, effective leaders are practical-minded. Effective leaders are confident, confident of what they do. Effective leaders are attentive to details. They pay attention to details. All right. So this uh, politics is in the eyes of the beholder, can you see? So people, some people play it negatively. Why some adopt effective practices in terms of management? All right. We progress. Factors that influence political behavior. Factors that influence, there are certain factors that influence political behavior. We have four individual factors, which is that is personal factors, and of course, organizational factors. With regards to individual factors, we we'll have self-monitoring, which plays an influence that influences political behavior. When a person is self-monitor, he check what is happening around him. He try himself, he try as much as possible to look good in the sight of people. Through that, he influences uh, 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 other people uh, in terms of uh, uh, within the organization which is one factor, uh, uh, one of the factors that influences political behavior. 
Another factor that influences political behavior is what is known as internal locus of control. Internal locus of control is the tendency of an individual to take control of what is happening uh, uh, around him. You know, he doesn't shift blame to outside uh, uh, occurrences. You know, he takes a kind of uh, 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 responsibility. He has a kind of locus of control. He sees uh, uh, achievement as his effort, what he can actually achieve by himself. That is internal locus of control. Can you see? Uh, somebody who has an internal locus of control will be able actually to exercise or exhibit some political behaviors within an organization. Another aspect is, of course, a high match personality. That is somebody who is actually seeking for power, can you see? So for an individual to influence other people, definitely has to show that uh, Machelan uh, personality, whereby he try to uh, uh, accumulate power or seek for power within an organization. Now with regards to also individual uh, uh, factor, organizational investment. Organizational investment uh, uh, in the hand of an individual can of, of course influence uh, 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 others within an organization. And of course, who the person uh, uh, in a kind of uh, 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 higher political uh, behavior when it comes to influence. And of course, another aspect is uh, perceived job alternative. If a person uh, uh, believe that uh, if he exercise certain illegitimate power, he can be sacked, definitely he will be more willing to exercise that power if he feels that he has an alternative job elsewhere. Can you see? Because if he feels that he doesn't have alternative job, uh, he may be very cautious to exercise Ill illegitimate power because if he sat, he will be back in the labor market. But if he believe that, yes, there's something waiting for him somewhere, he can attempt to exercise certain uh, political power. Another aspect is expectation of success. If a person believes that, okay, if he exercises a poli uh, political power or illegitimate power, definitely uh, there is a possibility that he will succeed. Definitely he can influence his political behavior. But if a person feels that definitely he may not succeed when he tries that in an organization, that may put a restriction in terms of his uh, political behavior with regards to influence. Now, organizational factors, organizational factors. The first one with regards to organizational factor is reallocation of resources. Reallocation of resources. For instance, if organization is, of course, uh, reallocating resources as a result of, of course, uh, either major or uh, 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 reorganization of an organization, definitely that can, of course, uh, uh, inform the political behavior of people, as people now will be struggling to, uh, of course, hold their own uh, resources to themselves. Can you see? That can, of course, uh, bring about political behavior in an organization. Promotion of opportunity also as a result of this uh, uh, change in organizational uh, uh, structure can also influence also political behavior within the organization with people trying to, of course, lock themselves down uh, so that, of course, they can move ahead of others, can you see, within an organization. And of course, no trust in an organization can, of course, reinforce political behavior, can you see? No trust, no, no, no trust bring about antagonism within an organization. So that can, of course, bring about uh, political behavior. Role ambiguity within an organization. If the roles are not clear within an organization, it can of course trigger political behaviors within an organization. And of course, unclear performance evaluation also can of course trigger political behaviors. When performance appraiser is unclear, definitely managers or leaders that are in charge of performance can of course manipulate such uh, performance appraiser system which of course uh, is a political behavior that can of course trigger 
a reaction also. And of course, zero sum reward. If the reward to one person is of course a, 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 a zero sum in terms of reward to another person, uh, when the gain of one person is a loss to the other person, that can of course result in political behavior in an organization. Democratic decision making. If the decision making meet participative decision making, it can of course reinforce also political behavior in an organization. High performance pressure. If there's pressure for people to perform, organization, a manager can only set him for high performance, which of course could be reciprocated uh, by people you are pressuring. Then of course, self-serving senior managers also can. Of course, when the manager is interested in the organizational web. So these are the individual and of course organizational factors that could influence. That could add a comes to rewards, of course, when they come to adverting of a punishment within an organization. So these are the factors that influence uh, political behavior within an organization with their yeah, uh, antecedent uh, uh, outcomes. All right. We're still talking about how do employees respond to organizational politics? How do they normally respond to organizational politics? How do employees respond to organization? There are different ways uh, 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 that employee uh, can respond to organizational politics. The first is that perception of organizational politics can lead to decreased job satisfaction. And when an organization is so political, definitely people will be hitting themselves. People will be trying to uh, kind of overdo things. That can, of course, decrease the satisfaction of employees, certain employees that are adversely affected by those political behavior in an organization. Another uh, 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 response to political behavior is increased anxiety and stress. Political behavior within an organization can increase stress level. If you know organization that have very tough or uh, have a uh, consistent and persistent political activities. You can see that most of the people in that organization fall sick. Some may even end up with stroke. Some may even end up with hypertension, high beat. End up with so many other sicknesses. In fact, including diabetes. Let me see. Come back, you doze up. Are you still there? Hello? Yes, Prof. Yes, we are here, but yes, Professor. All okay, here. Okay, I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing the kind of tone, tone, so I thought uh, the system has locked me up. So I just wanted to be sure. All right. So another aspect is increased turnover. Turnover is a rising uh, uh, trend in terms of attrition. Turnover, employee turnover is bad for organization. Turnover is the frequency with which people enter, employees enter and leave the organization. So if you have an organization or if you're managing an organization that people just come and they stay two months and they leave because of tension or because of politics in that organization, 
that would be a total waste for the organization because one, you are losing talent. And two, if you are recruiting new talent, you have to spend money to recruit them and actually recruitment agency. You have to spend time and money to host them, to interview them, to do every inquiry. You have to also induct them. You have to also train them if it is part of uh, uh, something they don't know before. So increase turnover is a bad uh, precedent for an organization. That is why if you read my article with Sylvia Nerish, or uh, who is now called Sylvia Scobert, you will see our paper on uh, retention of employee. Retention is the opposite of turnover. Retention is how do we, how we retain our employees to remain with our organization instead of employees leaving our organization. And so, so political behavior can of course increase turnover within an organization. How do employees respond to organizational politics? Employees can also respond in terms of reduced performance. Employees can definitely or deliberately say, say no, we are going to reduce productivity as a way of responding because if somebody is bullying you, somebody is using all kind of negative tactics on you. You may decide to continue staying with the organization, but you may become a saboteur within the organization. That is by sabotaging the organization, either reducing, and of course reducing performance is also part of different behavior, I you see. So definitely those are ways, different ways of uh, responding to politics or to the organization. We we'll progress. Now, some of the defensive, defensive behavior that you encounter with an organization <clears throat> when people are, of course, uh, not happy with, of course, uh, 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 the situation in the organization. Some of the defensive behavior include overconforming. The next one that is bunk passing. The next one is playing dumb. The next one is stretch, uh, stretching. The other one is stalling. And of course, when we talk about avoiding blame, how, do, how we try to avoid blame, we avoid blame by buffing, we avoid blame by uh, playing safe, we try to avoid blame by justifying our action, we try to avoid being blamed by scapegoating others, we try to avoid blame by misrepresenting uh, issues. And of course, in terms of avoiding change, in terms of political behavior, how do we avoid change? We avoid change by trying to prevent the change from happening. And of course, we avoid change also by doing a kind of self-protection. We protect ourselves from the influence of the change. For instance, of course, if the change will result in, of course, uh, if we are, you are a middle manager, if the change will result in the elimination of middle management as a result of flattening the organizational hierarchy, definitely as a middle manager, you may want to resist that change. In order to retain that hierarchy, that is a good example of self-protection. So with regards to overcoming, overcoming is strictly interpreting your responsibility. Can you see over, so that is overcome over conforming. That is a kind of strictly interpreting your responsibility by saying things like, the rule clearly states this. Can you see? Over conforming. That is avoiding action. Uh, where you, you try to show some strict interpretation to justify what you did by saying, of course, the rule clearly states. Or this is the way we have always done it. Can you see? which is of course a good example of overconforming. And of course, with regard to bond passing, I think I have mentioned what it's all about. That is transferring responsibility for the execution of a tax or decision to someone else to pass the ball, can you see? And of course, uh, playing dumb, uh, playing dumb is of course, avoiding an unwanted tax by falsely pleading ignorance or inability. Although you have the skill that uh, you tell your boss or manage, no, I don't know, I don't know this aspect. 
that you know it. I will see people doing it uh, often in organizations. And even sometimes we do it also uh, without knowing. Can you say maybe you are Sorry, have... sorry, Prof. Yes. Hi, Prof. Can I just, do you, do you know that your slides are not on? My slides are not on? Yes. Or maybe oh, it's just okay. me not seeing them. Okay, okay. No, uh, colleagues, uh, anybody, is there anybody not seeing the slides? I can see the I can see it, bro. You can see the slide. I can see the slide. I can see. Okay, maybe I'll, 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 I'll log out and log in again. Yeah, log out and log in again. Prof, my, Prof. while we on this um, point, my agent, uh, yes, go on. You can go, Eric. It's probably the same thing. Uh, I just want to know if we can have a leg stretch. Uh, yeah, that is after this uh, slide. After this slide, we'll take, uh, say, 15 minutes, 15 minutes uh, uh, leg stretch. Okay. After this slide, Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll take 15 minutes. All right. Then the last one that is uh, uh, playing dumb. Playing dumb. Uh, that is, of course, uh, like I said, uh, trying to avoid responsibility by or uh, doing a work by trying to claim that you don't know the job. Another one is stretching. Stretching is, of course, prolonging tasks. Avoiding actions, prolonging tasks that one person appears to be occupying. Can you see? For example, turning a two weeks task into a four months job. Can you see? Another one is stalling. Stalling is appearing to be more or less supportive publicly while doing little or not in privately. Can you see? When you see your manager, you appear to be doing a, you are, you are really committed to the work. You are doing a hard work. And when the manager is not there, you just relax and take a magazine and start reading. <laughs> and so just go to her. <laughs> you see? So that is a kind of uh, uh, stalling. And of course, uh, uh, when it comes to defensive behavior with regards to avoiding blame, the first one is buffing. Buffing is, uh, this is uh, a nice way to refer to covering your back. Can you see? Covering your back. It describes the practice of rigorously documenting activities to protect an image of competence and thoroughness. Can you see? That is covering your back, you know. And you hear people use that term every time let us cover our back so that when this thing boomerang, we know that we have covered our back. Now the next one is playing self, playing self. That is uh, uh, evading situation that may reflect unfavor unfavorably. So you try to avoid it, that is by playing self. And of course, justifying. Justifying is developing expectation that reduce one's responsibility. Developing explanation that reduces one's responsibility for negative outcome or apologizing to demonstrate remorse or both. That is, of course, uh, justifying. Scapegoating, that is placing the blame for a negative outcome on external factors that are not entirely blameworthy, that should, that shouldn't, uh, that should not be blamed. Can you see? Uh, misrepresenting simply means, of course, uh, uh, manipulation of information by distortion. Embellishment, making it look beautiful. Deception, selective presentation, and obfuscation. I see. That is, of course, uh, misrepresenting. Then uh, with regards to avoiding change, uh, when it comes to defend, uh, defensive behavior, uh, that is trying to, the first one is prevention. Trying to prevent a threatening change from occurring. If the threat, you see that the change is a threat to you, you try to uh, prevent it from occurring. Self-protection, acting in a way to protect oneself during change by guiding, by gauging, uh, sorry, guided information or other resources. That is, of course, with regard to self-protection. All right. We we'll progress. The next aspect is what is known as uh, impressive management. Impressive management, uh, which is part of the topic related to 
uh, uh, power and politics, or relate, particularly related to political behaviors in organization. Impression management is the process by which an individual or by which individuals attempt to control the impression others form about them. Can you see? A kind of window dressing. Can you see? If you, if you guys know about uh, in accounting, we talk about window dressing, where you present your balance sheet in such a way that it is attracted to investors and external stakeholders. That is known as window dressing. But now with regards to organizational behavior, or of course, uh, uh, human resources management, we refer to that as impression management, which is the process by which individuals attempt to control the impression people have about them or others form about them, can you see? And of course, uh, there are several techniques of impression management. The first one there is conformity. Conformity is agreeing with someone, someone else's opinion to gain his or her approval is a form of, uh, is also a form of ingratiation. Can you see? That is one aspect of uh, uh, impression management. And of course, that is, for example, a manager tells his boss, you are absolutely right on your reorganization plan for the Western Regional Office. I couldn't agree with you more, can you see? So you just show that, that you conform, you know, so that of course, you can of course get something uh, beneficial from, the, uh, from your boss. Agreeing with someone else's opinion to gain his or her approval is a form of uh, ingratiation. And of course, another aspect of uh, impression management is favor, can you see? Doing something nice for someone to gain that person's approval is a form of, is also a form of uh, ingratiation. Another aspect of, uh, of course, uh, of impression management is excuses. That is explanation of a, predic uh, a predicament Created events, can you see? Explanation of a predicament created event aimed at minimizing the apparent severity of the predicament is a defensive impression management technique, also. Can you see? That is excuses. Then the last one there is apologies. Can you see? Admitting responsibility in an undesirable event and simultaneously seeking to get a pardon for the action is a defensive uh, also approach to impression management. Can you see? You apologize. Yes, sorry, I'm wrong. A good example of that is uh, 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 an employee says to his boss, I'm sorry, I made a mistake in, this re in the report. Please forgive me. Can you see? So you have certainly some people will fall for it. Another one is of course self-promotion. Self-promotion is of course, highlighting one's best quality and downplaying one's deficit and calling attention to one's achievement is a kind of uh, self-focused uh, impression management technique, you see. So another aspect of course is enhancement. Enhancement is claiming that something you did is more valuable than most other members of the organization will take. is also a self-focused impression management technique. Another aspect is flattering, flattering. You know how you flatter your children also, you know, and what you want to obtain, most especially our mothers, our, uh, I believe also most of our female colleagues here know how to flatter their, their children uh, for the mothers in our midst, you know, uh, uh, when you want to send them to a message and you know the child will be a little bit, oh, mama, you first, first of all flatter him. Ah, John, John, <laughs> good boy, good boy, good John. Jolly, you will rub his head and say, oh, John, please God help me to get this. He will jump, he will run immediately because you have already flattered him and <laughs> he cannot actually oppose you again because you have weakened him by uh, that flattering. Can you see that is a, uh, a good example of flattering somebody. And of course, some good wife also do that to their husband if they want to get uh, some gift, you know, 
They will first flatter him. Oh, baby, you, you look good. You look good today. Ah, you know, you know, most especially towards the end of the month. You know, you look handsome today. Ah, I love that your outfit yesterday. Ah, baby, uh, can you get me this thing when you are coming back from office? <laughs> baby will be wicked already. And uh, he cannot say no again after the flattering. So uh, I think it's a uh, weapon most uh, 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 palatable with the uh, female gender. Uh, but of course, men can also use it also uh, to flatter uh, empl uh, uh, junior employees. Of course, also your children also in the family. Don't leave it only for uh, female to use. You can also use it also. Uh, to flatter your wife to do some of the uh, work that uh, you want her to also do for you or to support, you know. All right, that is flattering. And another one is uh, impression management is exemplification. Uh, exempt, so exemplification. Exemplification is doing more than you need to in an effort to show how dedicated and how Working you in an assertive, it's an assertive. I am to be, and you see, you try to do modern, and you see, be modern. You need in an effort to show how dedicated and how working you are within an organizational set. These are all different forms of uh, techniques of uh, impression management. All right, the progress is a political action ethical, and you see. It's a political action ethical. There are, of course, instances when political action may be ethical, but there are instances where it may be unethical. Now, the question that one has to ask himself whether a political action is ethical is, is the political action motivated by self-serving interests to the exclusion of the organization's goal? If the answer is yes, then that is unethical, can you see? Because uh, when we talk about unitarianism, that is, of course, the better good for everyone. And you see, striving for the good of the organization as a whole and its member. But when it is an issue that is actually uh, for uh, an individual self-interest, that is, of course, unethical. Then, of course, if the answer is no, that is the political action motivated by self-serving interest? If the action is no, then we can move to question number two. Question number two there is, does the political action respect the right of the individuals affected? Does it, affect, does it respect the right of individuals affected? And you see, if the answer is yes, then uh, 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 you move to question number three. But if the answer is no, if it doesn't respect the right of the individuals, that is automatically unethical, can you see? But if it respects the right of every individual, then we move to question number three. Number three is, is the political activity fair and equitable? Can you see? If the political activity is fair and equitable, that is of course, uh, if it is yes, the answer is yes. That is, of course, ethical uh, political action. But if the political action is, of course, uh, unfair and inequitable, or if the response to that question is no, uh, that is, of course, uh, unethical. All right. Thank you very much, colleagues, with regards to that particular uh, uh, slide. Any question? Hi, Prof. No yes. A, a quick, a quick, a quick one. Let me quickly take you back to. I just want uh, your views on something. Is that why you? Sexual harassment. Sexual harassment. Oh. Yes, uh, Carlos. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 where I come from. Uh, the sector I represent, which is, which is uh, exploration and mining. So your, voice is a, this... your voice is a little bit breaking. Can you set your microphone, Nancy? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. 
Yeah, so I was saying the sector I represent the most of the time mining and exploration. So we we have uh, seen a decline in uh, uh, women participation, especially in the in the field work. Mm -hmm. And uh, a discussion I had with a friend uh, who is also a, a geologist, a lady geologist, mm -hmm. is that um, there seem to be this issue of, you know, when you are out there exploring in the bush for, say, three months, you are mm -hmm. on a camp with guys and you are a lady, uh, it becomes a bit difficult. And um, mm -hmm. so most of them feel unsafe, actually, and, and we have honestly seen this decline in, in the number of, of their involvement in the exploration projects. So the yeah. question I wanted to know is, how do you tell? Because I mean, I mean, a single man may find a soulmate on that camp. So how do you, how do you differentiate uh, between genuine intention and what people would call sexual harassment? Because I mean, I, I, you know, on the campsite, I may meet someone that I will have a future with there. But because the environment is such that, you know, when you make, uh, when you, you, when you blink your eye, then, you know, it's seen as, uh, you know, something else. So, so I just wanted, you know, maybe, you know, you may have some, uh, you know, some, some good ideas around it because it environmentally also, I think it, 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 it makes it difficult, you know, to create relationships. And, and like I said, we have started losing most of, of the lady colleagues due to that. But sometimes perhaps it, it's really something that is genuine. Okay. Uh, the bottom line of the matter, like you stated, you spoke about soulmate. When there yeah. is uh, the issue is an issue of soulmate, meaning there is a consensus. There is an agreement between you and the other uh, 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 opposite sides uh, that, okay, uh, you can go uh, out together. So, you know, that may not be a case of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment actually simply means an unequal power relationship where somebody yeah. who is not actually looking for a soulmate sexually uh, yeah. uh, presents some unwelcome advances. So the other person that is being harassed uh, must be feeling the pains that, no, I don't like this person, but he seems to be pushing this thing or harassing me, can you see? So that is when the issue of sexual harassment uh, occurs, you know, with regards to that. But when yeah. it is kind of people falling in love, yeah, people can fall in love in the, in the course of duty, even the military uh, uh, in warfare. Military men and women fall in love uh, uh, during wartime, you know. So uh, that meant that would not amount to sexual harassment. But of course, uh, certainly also within the work environment, also there's also an advice that of course you guys should keep that outside the work environment, you know, not really portraying it now in the work environment where it becomes now an issue of gossip, where it can begin to affect also performance, uh, with regards to yourself and of course uh, your lover, can you see? So when it is an issue of love affair, we see most of those tendencies appearing because I remember also in, in my Senate, we discussed uh, at the Senate at the University of Johannesburg, we discussed this issue of sexual harassment with regards to the case of, uh, case relating to lecturers and of course students. And we were trying to actually talk about how ethical is it for a lecturer to befriend the student. And uh, of course, uh, I think uh, one of our uh, deputy vice chancellor, a woman also, uh, actually spoke up to say that, yeah, these things occur. But also, we must also not only push the blame on the lecturer, but also we have to find out also because a relationship must have been in existence, and maybe when the relationship goes sour, the student can report the lecturer of sexually harassing her, or if it is the other way around, harassing him, can you see? So that there is a need in terms of the committee that was set up to, first of all, verify whether there was a, a relationship that was in existence. 
and now the relationship was a kind of broken down. And you see that in that instance, one cannot actually call it a case of sexual harassment. It could be a case of relationship because everybody in the university are adults. And you see, and in fact, while we were talking, even one of the dean, a white colleague, was able to stand up and say he got his wife from the university. The wife he's living with today was his student, a master student. And they two fell in love after supervision, and finally they got married. So that is not a case of sexual harassment. That is a case of two adults having a kind of mutual understanding and, of course, a consensual relationship. And so, okay, we blend. But of course, we must be also cautious in order not to let our blending to cause distraction in terms of the work we are doing or in terms of bringing a kind of gossip in the uh, organization. Certainly in such instances, and of course, you know also that there are organizations that doesn't like couples to work in the same department. So if both of you are existing in the same department, there may be manager, uh, a, a very reasonable manager may decide to separate both of you. Maybe one can be in the marketing department, one can be in the purchase department, you know, so that of course, both of you will not be seen. Even in organization, if you are working in a particular organization, there are instances where rules apply, where husband and wife should not be in the same organization. Just for ethical reason or uh, for issues related to collaborating in a negative way, can you see? So that is that. With the instance, with the instance that you have provided, uh, it seems to me that uh, it is not a case of sexual harassment, but a, a case of falling in love. And uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 because both of you are working. Now, when you also refer now to issues of uh, women now uh, abandoning those kind of job is of course some may fall in love of course there may be tendency of others also to harass <laughs> you see that are not falling in love which is of course what is leading to the attrition rate of women uh, in that particular profession so uh, it, there are two aspects that you know when it is an advances with sexual uh, favor then definitely it amounts to sexual harassment. But when there is a mutual understanding, when there is a consensual understanding uh, uh, in terms of relationship, uh, that is that will not be a case of uh, sexual harassment. Is that okay? Uh, thank you. I think. I think. Lastly, the the gray area I see is that you know any relationship. Maybe maybe I'm speaking from business now, but any relationship somehow starts off from something where persistence is, is required. And that is where I was coming from to say, uh, you don't just meet someone today and there is already, you know, that uh, green light. So, and and that point of persisting that, look, I'm, I'm genuine, I, I mean this is, is, in my opinion, what is now considered from the sector I represent as, you know, you are harassing me because you know. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, that, that is why you yourself have to monitor the reaction of the person you are, uh, you are, you are approaching. If she, she begins to react, that no, I don't like this thing. You are doing. Uh, uh, this is that is unwelcome advances, you know. But if the person you are approaching is giving you a listening ear and she has already exchanged. Uh, numbers contact with you and not that okay there is a green light then you can always uh, come closer if you ask for his contact and she refuses know that she's not interested so that persistence should just be uh, just left out of the work uh, environment because if you continue to persist and the person feels uncomfortable or uncomfortable it becomes a hostile uh, 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 situation which of course amounts to uh, sexual harassment uh, you see so that is, uh, uh, that is the issue. And uh, of course, uh, uh, also we have to look at the power relationship. Uh, if the person you are, of course, trying to influence is also somebody younger than you or somebody lower than you in hierarchy, uh, that can, of course, uh, uh, that persistent can, of course, uh, become uh, automatic uh, sexual harassment. 
because you are not trying to use a kind of influence uh, to, to, to pursue the person. And most especially when you make the request, a condition for the work, a condition for the work that the opposite says is doing, then that automatically amounts to harassment. When you, when you use that as a basis of promotion or as a basis of denial of benefit, that automatically amounts to harassment, you see. So there are rules about sexual harassment. Uh, certainly, if I have time, I have a slide on sexual harassment so that I can also give you the nitty gritties of uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, you know. Uh, but because that is not, uh, uh, a specific topic on your uh, Lala guide uh, is a branch of a uh, uh, topic. Uh, 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 that is why I have not uh, included that slide among uh, uh, some of the topics. But since uh, uh, you want to get more information on it, if I have more time, I can expand on uh, social harassment uh, related topics. Well, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question? Any other question? All right. Uh, colleagues, uh, just like Eric uh, requested, can we take about uh, 15 minutes uh, comfort break? Uh, is uh, Sabrina, S Sabrina, you want to ask question? No problem, fine, thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you are here today. Yes, Prof. You were not here yesterday. I wasn't able to join yesterday. Okay, let me see. Uh, were you here last week, Friday? No, I wasn't either. Were you here on Saturday? I wasn't here last weekend. True art. Uh, <laughs> so you are now absentee. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that because uh, your participation has some math. Uh, your participation carries some math. All right. Okay, colleagues, uh, just like uh, Eric suggested, uh, we can take about 15 minutes comfort break. Is that okay? Sure, Prof. Oh, you need more minutes. I think plus should, should be fine. Plus should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. 